Number 10, construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes, pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there. And a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top? One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, here we go. Yep, found it. There it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Step Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier, four-sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt, and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager you know, the head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshiped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh, blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb, easy to find. But nope, no one can find her or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mummy may have been quote, the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the pyramid of Hawara, known as quote, 
the Labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferephra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be, quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and, quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three. The Dendera Lights. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say, the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor Temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake, emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside, taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground, the smoke, the heat, I don't think so. Now a couple of DeWalts, <laughs> just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt, it was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Cue Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your thing, let's go. And coming in at the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion, water? erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and a body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the 
years, who knows. The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt and archeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. Kicking off the list at number 10, secret archives. Okay, we'll start this list off with some secret archive myths that kind of kicks off everything that happens. The archives are 53 miles long. There's around 35,000 volumes of catalog and the Vatican's secret archives are no joke. It sounds like some national treasure stuff, but really there's, there's a lot to this. They're very real, but in order to see them for yourself, it's gonna have to take some time. The indexes aren't public, hence why I'm kicking this mysterious list off about them. Only scholars can access it after they're 75 years old. That's usually how it went. Their official purpose is to house the Holy See's official paperwork. And of course, it's a treasure trove of everything and anything related to the Pope. It's also full of ancient documents, because where else do you safely store a letter from Mary, Queen of Scots? Yeah, Mary was killed after serving roughly 20 years in custody, but eventually she was sentenced to death for conspiring to kill Queen Elizabeth I. Now, before she met her fate, she wrote a letter to the Pope, literally begging for her life, but of course, as we now know in history and life, the Pope did not intervene, and on February 8th, 1587, Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed. Number nine, Vatican tour. Things changed for the better come 2010. Those secret archives weren't so secret anymore. Dan Brown's bestseller, Angels and Demons, increased interest of the archives. We wanted to look into more secrets and also National Treasure kind of helped. Weirdly enough, National Treasure comes up a lot on this list. It's a theme, people like this. Also video games too, people love this Vatican stuff. So for the first time ever, the Vatican allowed journalists to tour it. This was 10 years ago. Now, the Secret Archives actually put out some of those important documents. This whole event was also celebrating its 400th birthday, so it was a big step in history, of course. But later on in 2019, Pope Francis announced that the Vatican would open its archives officially. This was the 80th anniversary of Pius XII's election to the papacy, and the archives would have been open for all of those months. And out of all the times to be open, it had to be opened in March 2020. Francis said the church is not afraid of history, and on March 2nd, 2020, they were finally opened. The church may not be afraid of history, but pandemics, that's a different story. The archives were closed shortly after due to COVID-19 restrictions that same month. It's almost like it wasn't meant to happen. Interesting. Number eight, exercise. The Catholic church authorizes the use of exorcism to those who are deemed possessed. Yeah, not just low budget horror movies, real life. This is what we're talking about. Exorcisms depend on a few things. Authorization from the church, of course, is important, and the faith of the exorcist. The actual exorcism at hand is when the church asks publicly and authoritatively that one individual becomes protected against the power of evil and they're withdrawn from their dominion. Yeah, you don't see those very often, thankfully, because that would be pretty jarring. The Catholic Church revised the rite of exorcism come 1999, but traditional rite of exorcism in Latin is still an option. So if you get possessed, sorry to tell you, it's slim pickings at this point. If you've seen a horror movie, any horror movie, these are not pleasant experiences. The demon possesses their physical body, it holds control over them, and that's when an ordained priest with permission of the local bishop, of course, comes to save the day. And in order to do so, you need to exclude the possibility of mental illness. It's gotta be legit. The late Pope John Paul II performed three exorcisms in his life, and Father Gabriel Amorth, the chief exorcist at the church, claims to have expelled more than 300 demons a year from the Vatican offices. That's like some Ghostbusters stuff. That's it's a lot of hours, they must be busy. Number seven, Mafia Ties. In The Godfather Part Three, spoiler alert, but there's a deal between the Mafia and the Vatican, and it leads into the Pope getting taken out. It's a pretty heavy plot. I watched it when I was younger, no idea why, didn't really understand at the time, but could this be a reality? Could the Mafia and the Vatican be up to no good behind closed doors? Back in 1978, September 29th, Pope John Paul I was found dead. Vatican officials declared the 65-year-old Pope's death his cause was from a heart attack, but the fact that he was only in office for 33 days has people like us scratching our heads. We have to ask a few questions. A couple of murderinos out there are like, hmm, what happened? It's a little fishy. There's never an autopsy done at the time, and at that time, the Vatican had ties with organized crime. Because back in 1982, only four years later, Vatican Bank President Father Paul Marcinkus resigned from his post after numerous scandals exposed bank ties with the Mafia. So the bank had to pay out more than $200 million to creditors. This was real life, not the Godfather. Marcinkus though, he was involved in a few mysterious deaths, even Pope John Paul I, but he retired and went to Arizona in 1990, and then he later passed away in 2006. A lot of connections here that were never really fleshed out. Number six, dead man on trial. This comes from 897 AD, and I can't believe this actually happened. It's one of those things you read about and you're like, people actually did this, like physically with their hands, they 
Okay, interesting. The Catholic Church back in 897 AD once put a man on trial who wasn't even alive anymore. Yeah, it's a little gross. Now, it's one thing to uncover more crimes or details that somebody has done after they pass away, that's normal, but to actually bring the body of the person to court, like Weekend at Bernie style, like physically bring them up the stairs, that's, really? The Catholic Church held a trial for Pope Formusus, who was accused of usurping the papacy, so his body, the dead body, may I remind you, was exhumed, dressed in the appropriate attire for court, can't believe there is one at this point for a dead body, then brought to court for judgment. Also, you must be wondering right now, how long were they dead for? One day? Two days? Was it a week? Was it two weeks? Seven months. Guy was dead for seven months, and they're like, well, just about time for that court. Let's do it. Dig him up. Of course, a deacon was appointed to speak on the Pope's behalf, because, like I just said, dead for seven months. But he was found guilty, and his body was then stripped, again, of the garments. So now they dressed him in rags, and his three fingers of benediction were cut off, and then he was then thrown into the River Tiber, that same river that Romans would dispose criminals into. So they undressed a dead guy to then formally dress him again, put him in different clothes, and then once found guilty, undress him, put him in different clothes, and then tossed into a river. I don't want to say it's a waste of time, maybe just a waste of arm strength. I don't know, bring your own nose plug. This is a really gross one. Number five, time machine. Okay, I have to throw this one on this list because this is a real theory. People actually believe there's a time machine hidden somewhere in the archives. It sounds to me like someone's playing a bit too much Assassin's Creed, but again, that's me and I'm doing the list, so let's talk about it. The machine itself is believed to have been built by Father Pellegrino Maria Ernetti, an Italian priest and, of course, as you guessed, scientist. It's called the chronovisor, but it's not really a time machine per se. It's kind of like that thing from Harry Potter where you drop a tear in, you put your face in, then you can see the future and past and all that jazz. It's one of those. Maybe we've already discovered it, but this damn time traveler keeps preventing us from getting in there. The more I talk about this, the more I'm convincing myself. This isn't good. Let's move on. Let's move on forward in time throughout the list. Number four, the third secret. When it comes to hidden documents in the archives, the only thing more intriguing than time travel is perhaps the third secret of Fatima. It all began in 1917 when three children from Portugal received prophecies. They were visited for the Virgin Mary six times in a short amount of time. The apparition is now known as the Lady of Fatima. The Virgin Mary told them three secrets. The first secret was a vision of the underworld, of hell. That was revealed July 13, 1917. The second secret was a statement about World War I ending, as well as a prediction of another war during the reign of Pope Pius XI, should Russia not convert and should men continue offending God. The third secret, Lucia chose not to disclose in her memoir in 1943. It was written down later on and delivered to Rome finally in 1957. The third secret was about the 20th century prosecution of Christians that came together in the failed murder of Pope John Paul II. That attempt was on May 13, 1981 which was the 64th anniversary of the first prophecy. But many believe the third secret is still unknown and that that's all just hogwash. The answers apparently lie in the Vatican. So far, many people believe the third secret has something to do with nuclear wars and natural disasters, but honestly, no spoilers. Let's just be surprised, you know? Number three, late night text messages. Turns out the Pope liked to text people. I'm not sure if Angry Birds was on the homepage, but realistically, it probably was. Texting was definitely on the agenda, this we know. Pope Benedict XVI would send texts out to his homilies, and come 2009, the Vatican started a YouTube channel. I felt it was only right to include this tidbit of information on a top 10 Vatican list, because when else could you talk about this? I'm like, smash that holy like button, gang, let's do it. It just it seems fitting, I don't know. The actual channel features addresses and ceremonies, all that good stuff. Really, it's a great way to use technology. But when the Vatican dropped an iPhone app, that's how you know that we're definitely in the future. The app contained, of course, the breviary prayer book and prayers of daily masses, but like now you can adjust the font. You know what I mean? Like this is the future. We can adjust the brightness on holy books. Never did I ever think this was a possibility. Somebody tell Jesus this is happening. This is huge. Number two, hidden proof. We've been looking for the Lord for a while now. You might see his face on a slice of toast if you're lucky. That's definitely a possibility. But conspiracy theorists believe that the archives could tell us more about St. Paul and Emperor Nero, meaning that we could find out more about Jesus, the big man himself. And if his existence was one, real, but also this could show us his biological descendants. How cool would that be? A great amount of people believe the Vatican is hiding proof that Jesus didn't exist. That's a popular conspiracy theory here. This would of course discredit the church, so if there was ever a place to hide said truth, the center of the whole operation is probably a safe bet. And finally, number one, the Illuminati. 
They've been talked about for years. The amount of artists rumored to be part of this Illuminati program conspiracy thing, it's, it's insane. That's an easy rabbit hole to fall down if you're on Reddit. Be careful there. But also, Beyonce and Jay-Z, for sure Illuminati. Confirmed. Yes, many people believe that the archives are also controlled by the Illuminati. And it's a specific type of Illuminati as well. It's not the same group that runs the music industry or anything like that. It stems from after its medieval dissolution. The Illuminati, over time, elected members to enter the big offices, including that of the Vatican City. So the OG showrunners of the Vatican are the Illuminati, apparently. I mean, great, we love ending on the craziest conspiracy theory ever. That's not bad. Believe it or not, there's actually people who think that there's aliens being stored in the secret archives as well, but I don't want to spend an entire point trying to convince you because, you know, can't spoil all the secrets. Kicking off our list at number 10, Secret Cinderella Suite. Cinderella's castle at Disney World. Of course, it's the main attraction. Without that castle, it would just be a Canadian theme park. Of course, the castle is a smaller scale than a real medieval one, so it's a surprise to find out there's actually a real hidden suite in there. And yes, it's quite magical. You can sleep there and probably get bed bugs. I don't know. To get there, you'll need to take a pumpkin carriage elevator. And in the actual suite, you'll find two beds and a pullout couch. Yeah, nothing more enchanting than a pullout. Who gets that one? Let's draw straws. There's beautiful stained glass windows, a fireplace to keep you warm at night in Florida. But I almost forgot the most important detail. You need to be invited. Yeah, you gotta be important. Can't just buy your way in, right? Can't just get daddy's credit card and fast pass your way in that line. You gotta win a contest or something like that. I don't think I'd want to spend a night there, to be honest. It doesn't look very cozy. It's like one of those cottages you stay at and you're like, I'm scared, I'm really uncomfortable. This is a little too old for me. Number nine, DMZ. Despite what its name says and implies, the Korean demilitarized zone is perhaps one of the most militarized places in the entire world. It's like, hey, there's nothing going on here with military stuff. This is the location that marks the separation between North and South Korea, and it was established to serve as a sort of buffer zone between two countries. There are tons of military facilities in this zone, and only high-ranking officials are allowed in. You'll hopefully never see this. This is exactly what led to the creation of the civilian control line, which is a line that created an additional buffer zone to the demilitarized zone, which is meant to further restrict access to any civilians or unauthorized personnel. So they added more of a do not enter stick. You'll never see this. Number eight, Surtsey Island. This island was born in 1963, and by that I mean literally. It emerged from the sea in that year, just off the coast of Iceland, after four years of being formed by an undersea volcano. Yeah, brand new island, nice. Happy birthday, I guess? What do we do here? What could we possibly do with a new island? Well, I'm sure humans could find a million and one ways to ruin it. Like, you know, put another Cinderella suite in the middle of it, probably. And surprisingly, we decided not to do that at all. Instead, this island was protected in order to allow scientists to study how ecosystems form and what happens when there's zero human involvement. That's the whole idea. Yeah, not a bad call, right? This means that those who are permitted to go to the island have some super strict rules to adhere to, right? No touchy-touchy, no spit, no crying. There's nothing, no one should know that we've ever been here, right? One of these rules is no seeds, okay? and no using the facilities on the island, okay? No taking okay? You gotta hold it until 6 p.m. Have fun, don't forget to clock in. That second rule is in place because one day scientists found a tomato growing on the island and they were quite confused as, you know, how, considering what I just told you. Yeah, it turns out somebody had gone number two not too long past and then, you know, a tomato came out because he had a little seed in his, uh, his own Right, you got it. Number seven, Ed and Lorraine Warren's Occult Museum. Okay, heading into Spookyville for this one. If you've seen Annabelle Comes Home, this next one should ring a bell. The character Daniela in the movie, she tries to communicate to a loved one beyond the grave, but in order to do so, she puts on a bracelet from Ed and Lorraine's Occult Museum. It's called a morning bracelet. It's kind of like the Q-ray bracelet, but does the opposite things. Makes you cursed instead of smart. Now, there isn't a morning bracelet in the real life Occult Museum, but there is such thing as the Pearls of Death. And those are locked away. Those are very real. Those are lovely too, might I add. These pearls were added to the museum after a woman claimed they were strangling her on its own, which is absolutely terrifying. It's like those candy necklaces that we had growing up and they'd get tight all of a sudden. You're like, oh my God. The second this poor woman put these pearls on, she needed everybody around her to help yank them from her neck. Now these haunted pearls sit in the Ed and Lorraine Occult Museum. These ones have nothing on Martha Wayne. Oh Lord. Number six, Naples Secret Adult Room. Scandalous Pompeii Excavations. Ancient Playboy, here we go, this one's pretty funny. After the eruption of Mount Vesuvius back in 79 AD, the small city of Pompeii was sadly covered in hot ash. 
The ancient Roman ruins are still being uncovered today, but back in the 1700s, most of the city was excavated for the first time. And the king of Naples got the best of the best, right? First dibs. Most of the contents are now kept in the archeological museum in Naples, but some have to be held in the secret room. Yeah, see in the past, you had to receive permission from the king to take a peek into this sensual, oh, sensual art. There were 30 brothels in Pompeii, so of course, surrounding artwork served as advertisement for said brothels, if anything. Just old drawings or carvings of people intertwined with one another. Yo, I found Dad's stash. <sighs> Number five, Svalbard Seed Vault. Deep within a mountain that sits in between Norway and the North Pole sits this vault that is more than 320 feet deep. It's just hidden inside of a mountain, okay? This vault holds a massive collection of seeds. It'd be the worst case for that other island, eh? They're like, no, keep this vault away, please. N none of those. The vault that holds these seeds are made to withstand both man-made and natural disasters. And the seeds held inside are meant to be kept safe so that in the case of sort of, you know, a huge disaster or the end of the world arrives, seeds will be fine. Yeah, we're good. Just some watermelon seeds will make it, but we're all doomed. Sick. The seeds kept safe inside would ensure the continuation of a wide variety of diverse food options in case things go south, you know what I mean? The door to this vault is only open a few times a year and just a few people are allowed inside in order to deliver seeds to their shelves. Yeah, just a doomsday vault full of seeds, that's great. Now I'm nervous. Number four, Snake Island. This island's located in Brazil and it's one of the most dangerous in the entire world because of the name I just gave you. It's full of snakes. I don't think I have to explain this one. It is thought that Snake Island came to be when the snakes got trapped as a result of the rising sea levels, which then disconnected the island from the mainland, and then all these snakes got stuck here, and now it's just full of snakes. This is so horrible. The reason people aren't allowed to visit is obviously to protect humans who don't want to go and get attacked by thousands of snakes, but also to protect the snakes from thousands of humans, because we're pretty as well. Just like anywhere else in the world, because of the lack of human interference, they're striving. It's actually a healthy, beautiful island. That's what the snakes said, not me. I don't like snakes, but the snakes seem to like it. They're having a great time together. It's like Survivor season 58, just snakes. There's a critically endangered species of snake called a golden lance head on this island. There's about 4,000 of them, which is, of course, critical to the species continuing on. So let's not touch it. Let's not poke any snakes, let them live. As of now, only a few select researchers and the Brazilian Navy, of course, are permitted to go to the island. Number three, Disney's underground tunnels. Back to Disney, where dreams are made of, or something like that. In a place like Disney, there has to be room for employees to take a breather, right? That much time and character, all those high fives. I mean, I've done mascot work for a theme park before. It's hot, it's sweaty, it's gross. It's not the easiest job, but they're humans too, okay? They need to take breaks, clock in and out, all that jazz. Where does that magic happen, okay? This needs to be away from the public eye, of course. You can't have people watching as Mickey takes his head off to go for a smoke. No way, that's, magic is completely rude at that point. So instead, Disney has these hidden underground tunnels to move around the park Park without worrying about staying in character or getting caught in large crowds. During the early park days, Walt Disney himself saw a cowboy from Frontierland walking through Tomorrowland, and it just didn't make any sense. He's like, wait a minute, the timeline's here, he's got a hat and space, what? It took him out of the magic, right? More than fair. So he made 392,000 square feet of underground tunnels. And yes, they look as creepy as I'm describing them to be. There's zero magic in these tunnels. I mean, God, can you throw a poster up or something? Number two, restricted Aboriginal art. While some collections are kept out of sight for museum visitors because they're, you know, extremely scandalous in nature, like, Mmm, one of those. Others are kept in secret rooms out of respect. We don't want people touching or messing with these things. At the National Museum of Australia, David Klaus, senior curator of the museum's Aboriginal programs, he wrote this long report explaining on the choice to hide these artifacts from history and why he does so. David himself has said, quote, that is the responsibility of museums to respect the cultures they want to depict. The public use of Aboriginal secret and or sacred objects is not consistent with this responsibility, end quote. He's like, yeah, because they didn't want them to be seen. It's kind of simple. In order to gain access to these restricted Aboriginal projects, these beautiful pearl shell ornaments, all these things, you need permission from traditional Aboriginal custodians. Again, no fast passing on this one. And finally, number one, North Sentinel Island. Heading over to India, this island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe, one of the most forbidden islands in the world. But why is that? Well, it's located in the Bay of Bengal. North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India, okay? It's pretty far out. And while most islands are shrinking or coming out of nowhere, this one actually grew back in 2004. 
The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides gained an extra kilometer, which is pretty useful because the inhabitants on this floating cursed island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for thousands of years. There's no sign of agriculture or even fire, yet somehow this tribe has continued to thrive. If we try and get close, they try and drive anybody away. In fact, sadly, back in 2006, two fishermen lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it. The Indian government didn't roll up to the beach and start interrogating locals and taking names. Hey, who did that? No, instead, it's now forbidden to go to the island. We're just gonna respectfully leave it be. 